So I think we can we can start. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this launch of the publication Transitional Justice in the European Convention on Human Rights, um, written by Fiona La Lane, who is with us tonight. I think if we would have presented on uh, counterterrorism in Mali, the room would be full. Uh, but uh, I think with transitional justice, we still have some groundwork to do. But uh, that's what we are, what we are, what we are, what we are here for, and we hope that this publication will also help to um, to inspire uh, people to to think and work um, on 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 on, tra on transitional justice. Before introducing um, our guest uh, tonight, um, I just want to say a few words um, how we got there, how we got to the, to the publication. Um, one thing is that uh, the Geneva Academy um, has a clear focus on transitional justice. Um, since 2016, the Academy is running a master's program on transitional justice, uh, human rights and the, and the rule of law, and some of our students are, are here tonight, so we very much welcome them um, as well. And also another area where we want to do more and um, is the area of research. Um, we are looking to finding projects uh, in the area of transitional justice research and uh, the publication we are launching here tonight is part of this endeavor uh, to, to, um, to have more publications um, uh, at, at the Geneva Academy on, on, on transitional justice. One um, clear priority for us at the Geneva Academy is also to uh, engage in cooperation, in cooperation with other academic institutions, uh, with other um, stakeholders who work uh, on transitional justice. And uh, actually this product uh, here tonight is actually a nice uh, kind of uh, cooperation product between the Geneva Academy and um, the Transitional Justice Institute in Ulster. Um, where Fiona La is teaching and where she's one of the, the experts actually working on transitional justice. And uh, the Transitional Justice Institute in Ulster has over the years really become uh, one of the leading institutions, I would say, in, in transitional justice thinking, in transitional justice um, academic work. And it, uh, it remains one of the leading, uh, leading institutions. So we're very proud to, to, to be able to cooperate with them uh, on on this, on this, on this interesting um, publication. So, as I said, I mean, um, uh, Fiona La um, comes out of the Ulster School, so to say, of transitional justice, and uh, we borrowed her, no, her for a while now, for the next six years, uh, to the counterterrorism area because uh, Fiona La has been appointed as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms while Countering Terrorism. But we want her back after the six years to the field of transitional justice. Um, so, but I think uh, there are interesting uh, things Fiona La can do in this area, also with this experience of transitional justice and, and, and coming and living through a conflict, really, in, 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 Northern, in, in, in Northern, Northern Ireland. So Fiona La um, is now the UN Special Rapporteur, so we welcome, we congratulate her also on this, on this appointment. Um, but uh, she obviously has a very impressive um, academic record. Uh, she is the Dorsey and Whitney Chair in Law of, uh, at, Uni at the University of Minnesota Law School. Um, she's a professor of law at the Ulster University's Transitional Justice Institute. Uh, she has published extensively, not only on transitional justice, but also on human rights, uh, security issues, um, uh, questions of, um, of, uh, of gender, feminist legal theory. Uh, so please, um, I mean, really we are very, very, very honored to, to, to have her, have her here, here with us uh, today. The publication we are launching here today actually was um, born um, back in, two, the idea for this publication was born back in 2015 when we had Fiona La here with us uh, as a, the key lecturer during the, um, the summer school on transitional justice that Geneva Academy was organizing for, for, for some years, the Antonio Cassese summer school on transitional justice. And during the summer school um, uh, we talked about uh, the idea of having a publication on transitional justice and the European Convention on Human Rights. And um, the idea came because there, we felt there is a gap uh, in, in research. A lot of focus is on the inter-American system. Um, so there's a lot of um, research and publications in the area of what uh, 
the uh, Inter-American Court for Human Rights is saying on transitional justice, what the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is saying on transitional justice. But uh, there was no comprehensive study really or no comprehensive research done on the linkage between transitional justice and the European Convention on, on, on Human Rights. And we thought it would be timely to do so, um, also to have a, a reference uh, tool uh, for practitioners also who work in, in, this, in this field, but also obviously for, 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 for academics. Um, I think there are three uh, kind of key messages coming out of this publication, at least for me. Um, and um, one message coming out of this publication is that uh, history is important. Um, the European Convention for Human Rights, as Fiona La writes, in, in, her, in, in, her, in her publication uh, was really born out of the experience of the, the Second World War and the atrocities which were committed during the Second World War. So being aware of this um, and taking a, a historical approach uh, to transitional justice is, I think, one big message which comes out of, um, of, of this publication. The second message, I think, which comes out is that uh, the here and now, the presence is important to look at. And uh, there are current contexts in Europe um, which are transitional justice contexts, or which uh, basically where transitional justice is relevant. I mean, think about Bosnia, think about Northern Ireland, think about Russia, uh, think about Turkey. And there, obviously, the European Court of Human Rights has jurisdiction, um, is an actor. Uh, and uh, there, the message coming out of the publication is really one of innovation and really one of that this convention is a living document uh, which needs to be adjusted in accordance uh, with, the, with, the, with the context. And, um, and, and I think that's an important message that the presence and the here and now is important. And the last uh, message I think which, um, which kind of comes out for me from this publication is uh, um, the hope for a better future, uh, which is also something this hope transitional justice brings with it, because transitional justice has a very strong um, kind of emphasis on the future. It's not just looking back, but it's looking back in order to build a better future. Um, and I think the European Convention, and as Fiona La writes convincingly in her publication, is a for, has a very, the European Convention for Human Rights has a very strong forward-looking dimension. And I think there is where transitional justice and uh, the European Convention for Human Rights meet. Um, so I think these are the messages I take from this publication. Um, but then I'm not the main person here tonight. The main person is uh, Fiona Lai, and I would invite her to come over uh, here and um, to give, she will give um, a 20 to 25 minutes uh, presentation on the state of the field of transitional justice, but linking it also to the European Convention for Human Rights. Just to say again that thank you very much for being here tonight with us. It's a great honor uh, for both Frank and myself uh, to, to have you. And um, after your presentation, we'll have some time also for, for discussion. So please. Thank you all. Thank you for coming out on a slightly cold and damp night in Geneva. And it's really nice to have an actual copy of this. I've been seeing it on a computer for a couple of months and to see it in your hand, it's like, a lit I shouldn't say it's like delivering a baby, but it has the quality of pr production that is similar. And um, I really want to thank um, Thomas Unger and Frank Hadelman for their persistence in seeing through the completion of this publication from uh, conception to printing. I, I was very pleased two years ago when I was asked to join the Geneva Academy Summer School. And one of the reasons I was pleased is that I knew uh, in advance, although I didn't know either um, Frank or Thomas at the time, that I would have a stimulating and engaged intellectual experience. And that proved to be very much the case. And I see much of what I saw that summer now translated into your master's program. So it's just really nice to see that uh, vision and that, um, that intellectual and spirit, but also the engagement at the very nitty-gritty policy level, also part and parcel of your conception of the work that you do.
Um, and more than anything else, um, it has brought us to a very um, fruitful friendship, and I'm also very pleased to have that. So thank you both. So my remarks today have two goals. Um, the first is to address the state of the field of transitional justice, as it were, and the second is then to apply some of the insights from the state of the field analysis to the specific space of the, of the Council of Europe and more particularly the European Court. So let me start by saying uh, first that one of the hallmarks of the field at the moment is its success. How do we measure that success? Well, we can measure it in a number of ways, but most specifically we can perhaps measure it by what might be called institutional consolidation. The nature of transitional justice, starting from a field which had a sort of a patchwork quality, a regional quality, uh, debates over even when the field started. Did it start, as uh, uh, some suggest, in, in ancient times? Is it a post-World War II phenomenon? Is it, a, is it a creature of the Latin American transitions? Uh, is it really, as some would suggest, a relatively new field or a very old field? And actually, some of those debates have collapsed, I think, as we've seen the, this con consolidation of the field. Uh, how do we mark that consolidation? Well, first of all, we see it in many of the institutions which now populate the field, one of which is uh, the Special Rapporteur for Transitional Justice, an institutional framework or agency within the United Nations. We also see it in dedicated NGOs, the International Center for Transitional Justice in New York. We see it in int academic institutions. Both of our institutions reflect an institutionalization of the field in the very fact of the discipline having a space to teach and do research as a standalone field, we use that word. Uh, it is also, I think, the success of the field is, uh, is seen in the, the way in which the language of transitional justice has permeated global, legal, and political conversations. We cannot think of a peace process today in which the language of amnesty is not ubiquitous. Increasingly, we see processes of a conflict ending or, uh, or transition as including truth commissions. And those are not simply coming from transitional justice actors, whom we would expect to use those words and those phrases, but it's actually been sort of internalized by what we might think of as mainstream political actors in a, in a variety of spaces. Um, we also see, I think, the, the consolidation of the field in the sense that transitional justice mechanism practices and languages are now used in the context of, quote, ordinary justice. So when Canada and Australia decide that they're going to deal with their historic grievances related to the stolen children or the institutionalization of children, they use the language and the practices of transitional justice to do work. So we see the space of transitional justice being, being absorbed and used by consolidated democracies to do work that we would not otherwise have think, think of them as doing using, using transitional justice. And actually in my own field, in the field, my new field, as it were, uh, the terrorism field, I also see a permeation of transitional justice language. A very concrete example of that, for example, I'm seeing in the use of amnesty discussions in the ways in which we will think about dealing with returning foreign fighters. That, again, demonstrates the kind of reach and stretch of the field. So the success of the field is one of its markers. And in some ways, this publication, the idea that one would talk about the European Convention in the context of transitional justice, is also a marker of that success. Um, the second, I think, definitional quality of the field is its limits. So just as we recognize its success, we're also increasingly seeing the boundaries and the limits of the field. So let me talk a little bit about those boundaries and their relationship to the European Convention. I think one of the biggest um, challenges for the boundary of the field is defining what constitutes success for transitional justice. Transition, the etymology of the word transition is literally a from and a to. And so at a, I think there are various points where we have tried to kind of pin what does that from and to mean. But the question of defining TJI, TJ success is an increasingly fraught one. It's one that preoccupies transitional justice scholars. And also it's one that preoccupies transitional justice funders. So as the field is underpinned by uh, not just states, 
but also by global funders, the question is they're asking us are what does transitional justice deliver? What does it give us? And so what this has led to, I think, in the first instance, is an increasingly data-driven quality to the field of transitional justice. Scholars like Catherine Sickink and Lee Payne and others um, have sought to create massive databases, quantitative data as a measure of what we do and how we do it has become one of the ways in which we define whether or not transitional justice is succeeding. Um, but one of the challenges of that measurement is that everything becomes transitional justice and nothing is transitional justice. So when we apply these large scale data analyses to the, to the field, uh, we often struggle to figure out cause and effect. Do we have better rule of law because of transitional justice? Do we measure that in terms of how many trials have taken place? Do we measure it by truth commissions? Do we measure it by other ethereal qualities that we can't even start to measure? Like how would we even start to measure the degree of success at reconciliation in a society? How would you put boxes around that? So the limits of the field I think are being demonstrated in trying to figure out how well we have done what we have done. And in a sense, this publication works against that trend because my view has and remains that these data-driven enterprises are actually both conceptually and very practically limited in understanding what kind of work transitional justice does in particular places and in particular regions. And the publication itself and the focus on the European Convention, a micro-analysis of the European Convention, is to say you can't number crunch transitional justice in the European space. What you can do is take a series of issues, whether it's amnesty, uh, property restitution, lustration and vetting, and you can try to understand in particular country contexts what you have learned from that exercise. But you won't run a bunch of numbers to tell you if you've done well or not. So in some sense, the, con the study of the convention is a resistance against the data-driven uh, tendencies of the field. A second, I think, limit of the field that we might see is, this, is the phenomenon of what we call post-transitional justice. As a number of you will already be aware, transitional justice scholarship has developed this new uh, concept, partly actually uh, derived from the work of a colleague of mine in Belfast, Kath Collins, um, that says, you know, we've had phases of transition. Her work is primarily in Latin America, and she looks at the ways in which transition was done maybe 20 or 30 years ago in Guatemala, in El Salvador, and others, other places. And suddenly, 20 years later, we're right back again doing transition mark two. So post-transitional justice is ide this idea that transitional justice is done more than once that we are actually in, an, in a cycle of transition. And actually, I think this challenge of post-transitional justice, which is stretching the field, and it's stretching the field because politically many states are saying, we did this already. We've done transition. Why are we doing it again? It's also stretching the legal limits of the field because if you've done it once, we run into all kinds of issues of due process and we say we go back again. But I think the European Convention actually in part illustrates the, the Groundhog Day quality of transitional justice. That in many of the contexts that we are dealing with, and I take Northern Ireland as an example of this, some of the issues that we are dealing with in transition are in fact cyclical, that we go through phases and processes that are almost repetitive in order to uncover or address the issues of um, of human rights violations. Moreover, as we are starting to see in countries like Spain, when you choose not to do transitional justice in the European context, there are downstream consequences from that that will come back to bite you as a, trans a post-transitional uh, justice phenomenon. So that's the second challenge or limit of the field that I think is also manifesting itself in the European space. The third uh, challenge of the field uh, in this area in terms of limits is the quality of justice. And so I think one of the major conceptual challenges for the field is whether or not there has been a sufficiency of measures of redress for victims and 
a sufficient societal benefit from transitional justice. And these questions, I think, are profoundly with us in the European context, partly because of the structural limits of the European Convention itself. The Convention is one that, as I, as I explore in the, in the publication, is at its best when it deals with individual violations, one person, one harm. But transitional justice is, by its nature, a body of practice that deals with mass problems, mass harms, collective and systematic harms. And so, in many ways, the quality of justice, which is a, which is a broader problem for transitional justice, is a very specific problem in the European space, partly because the very instrument we have to do the work of transitional justice is one that has structural limits. <clears throat> because it has, as I note in the, pub in the publication, a structural inability to deal with systematic and gross violations, or at least has had to date. The fourth challenge of, or the limit, the fourth limit of the field is what I might call the ambition limits of the field. The field has been extraordinarily ambitious, and it has promised a great deal particularly to victims. But I think the field has grown without the resources to match its ambition. And this is also true of the European space, that the resources available to match the needs and the claims of victims, even in terms of the capacity to absorb uh, the claims, is extremely limited. Let me move on to my third category, which is the power of the field. One of the so one of the things that I think has challenged the field of transitional justice is the, the, the question of where the production of knowledge lies in the field of transitional justice. We are doubtlessly all aware of the ways in which elite institutions and actors in the global north in particular produce and sustain knowledge about actors, geographies, and issues in the global south. And while the consolidation of transitional justices, which is associated with countries such as Argentina, Chile, Guatemala, uh, which has produced much of the core content of transitional justice in many ways, much of the theory and practice of the field is actually located outside of the places and spaces in which the violence takes place. And this is increasingly true as transitional justice is applied to post-conflict societies, which are largely in the global south. But I think one of the things, as we think about these imbalances in the translation of knowledge and in the production of knowledge in transitional justice, I think the European case is quite distinctive and important. First of all, I think it's really important, as some of the cases I explore in the book tell us, Northern Ireland, Chechnya, now Ukraine, uh, uh, Turkey, um, they all tell us, in fact, that transitional justice isn't happening out there, it's actually happening right here. I'm always surprised when visitors come to Belfast to, to visit our city, that European visitors are often profoundly surprised that there is a conflict zone in Europe, that it looks like Middle England, except that there's been sustained violence in this place for 30 years. And so I do think that one of the things that we gain from an emphasis on transitional justice in the European space, and in terms of recognizing systematic human rights violations, is we cease to other the violence that happens in other spaces. Um, the second thing I think we learn is, and I say this from the context of Northern Ireland, but not exclusively, is that the country studies in Europe who have struggled with all of the resources that are available to Western European societies and have struggled to make transition work, they reveal the limits of transitional justice. If a society like Northern Ireland, which is situated in Northern European hemisphere with a functional uh, rule of law system, roads that get you from A to B, advanced hospitals, all of the other infrastructures and capacities that enable a society tr to transition violence. If this society is struggling with all of the tools that are available to it, it teaches us very, something very important about the expectations we have for societies and places that similarly don't have the same kind of infrastructures. <clears throat> 
The third thing I think we learn from the European context in terms of powers and inequities in the field is that the legacies of transition or non-transition, whether that's in the context of World War II legacies, the failure to deal fully with the legacy of the Second World War in many European countries, the failure in Eastern European transitions, and the pact of forgetting, forgetting that took place in Spain, that all of these have painful contemporary uh, costs. In Spain, we see it in some of the frames and the language of the discussions of Catalonia and uh, in, the, in the current moment. But in Eastern Europe, as we see the struggles of states like Hungary and Poland to in fact maintain some kind of democratic function, I think we can be painfully aware that some of that is a failure to address transitional justice adequately in those spaces. The third broad theme I take away from the, from the global, from the sort of the state of the field is the importance of the local. And we say this, um, this point that the local is really important in transitional justice, and it's said consistently by practitioners and by scholars and by uh, states, but in practice it's observed more in the breach than really internalized and applied. So why does the local matter? Well, I think as this publication shows, the particularity of the local demonstrates the potential and the limits of transitional justice. Again, in Northern Ireland, in other places, the local continues to define and shape the capacity for post-conflict compromise and accountability. And the local in Europe is profoundly shaped by the European Convention. The second thing we learned is that there is an, a consistent importance in engaging and maintaining the buy-in of local actors and local civil society to the transitional project. The third thing we learn, and I think this is particularly true of a number of cases, is in the European context, is that there is continued reliance on the European Court of Human Rights as the mediator of the post-conflict transition. The epitome of this right now is the Ireland-UK case. This case was first taken in 1973. It involved interstate allegations of torture involving both Ireland and the UK. And the case has been reopened at the European Convention level precisely to address a range of issues that were not addressed in 1973, or more particularly that the British government of the day chose not to make public. But what that tells us is that these cases remain live and pertinent to the resolution of contemporary debates. So let me conclude by saying, um, as, I, as we think about, as I reflect on the state of the field, what do, I, what, do I, what do I conclude? Well, first of all, that in general, for transitional justice scholars and practitioners, we need far more modesty than we have exhibited to date on what can be achieved and that most importantly, we need to avoid creating unrealistic expectations for victims in countries and in political spaces where there are no resources to manage those expectations. The second thing I think we learn, and the convention study teaches us this particularly, is that the concept of the long haul is the most applicable to transitional justice struggles. When we understand better that transitional justice is not a quick fix, that it is a long and arduous process, that it will involve a sustained accounting and an unrelenting long-term engagement, then we better understand what work and in what timescale transitional justice had to do. The third thing we learn is that strong institutions do strong work. And here the role of the convention as a, quote, strong instrument with capacity and ultimately with some political backbone through the Council of Europe needs to be prepared to exert more radical muscle on sustained and enduring human rights legacies. Um, it will be particularly important for, Euro for the European Court to name sustained egregious patterns of human rights violations, not only that speak to individual action, but to state acquiescence and compliance. And finally, what I think we learn in the, as we conclude is the value of integrated and holistic transitional justice, that selective and piecemeal transitional justice never does the work that needs to be done, 
but that as we talk about holistic transitional justice, we understand that it functions in a variable geometry, meaning that the sequence doesn't have to be precisely the same for every single state, but the core elements have to all be present in some kind of um, engagement with one another for transitional justice, both to have meaning, traction, and long-term success. So thank you. So thank you very much, Jonala. That was a, a very good starting point for now, a discussion we will have. Before that, I'd like to say thank you very much for this um, collaboration on this uh, book. This has been, you know, sometimes academy is a bit of a bumpy road. And then sometimes you meet people like um, Fionnala and you have these exchanges, intellectual exchanges, and then you feel, oh, it's really, it's nice to be here and to work on, on ideas. So, and I think this is the outcome of this sort of exchange. So thank you very much also for the friendship. So before handing over, because the idea is really that we have an exchange tonight about the ideas in, in the book and in, in things you said. Before that, I would like just to kick off with two questions. The first question would be a bit explanatory, kind, and the other one a bit more critical. <laughs> I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> so the first one is really about... Um, so one of the major theses of your book is publication is that the European um, Convention serves as a transitional justice instrument in various contexts in Europe. And that's uh, something quite new. I have never heard it in this way. You know? So you're quite um, ambitious in this, in, this, um, in this publication, saying this so, so loudly. Hmm? And uh, you give examples. Now, um, what I would like to, to know a little bit more, to have is maybe an example, to see how, these, how this interaction between the European Convention on Human Rights and Transitional Justice works, and uh, the uh, Irish case, the Northern Irish case, would be a very good case, I think, to, to give an example. So I would ask you to maybe to give us an example which, which situation in Northern Ireland where you can see that the, Northern, that the European Convention really had an impact on, on the ground. That, that would be my first question. And the second one is a bit more, more critical. As we, with many students here tonight, um, we have talked a lot about this new critique called uh, Justice from Below, and also colleagues of yours which are, who have worked on that, uh, Meki Woy and others, so very familiar with, the, with this thesis. And I would like to ask you, how would you respond to the critique that actually your argument is very much an argument from above, um, formalistic, legalistic, and not taking into account uh, sufficiently local mechanisms. Now, I don't want to be unjust because I know you said the contrary just in the moment, but I think it's very important to address that criticism, so I would very much like you to, to start with that. So, um, to say that it's... So, one of the things I should say about it being a transitional justice instrument is I think it's a transitional justice instrument by default in some ways, right? Meaning that the court doesn't proclaim itself to be a transitional justice instrument. Although if we look at the drafting history of the convention, we find language in the articulation of the rationale for the convention, and in particular to the preamble of the convention, that suggests that the states drafting the convention were aware of the document as a way of addressing the past, right? Particularly the immediate past. And although the language of guarantees of non-repetition, that phrase, which for transitional justice scholars is like saying ABC, you know, this is the words we use, that phrase, if you go looking for it in the 1950s, you're not going to find it. But what you will find is uh, articulations, I think, in the drafting history of the convention, where states were forward-looking, to use that term, and saw the convention as a form of guarantee against the, the kinds of atrocities that had just taken place repeating themselves. So it's in that sense that I think we understand it as a transitional instrument. And, and I'm not, I, I would say, I don't always think you have to use the word transitional justice for transitional justice work to be done. And sometimes that's because people don't know the word, but sometimes because other language might serve us better. Now, to answer Thomas's question about Northern Ireland, litigation at the European Court of Human Rights once the conflict reignited in 1967 started almost immediately. 
And again, you had a conflict, a conflict in a Western democracy in Eastern, in Western Europe, um, and you had a whole range of challenges, torture, systematic torture and detention. You had the use of force, extrajudicial killings, and there was no commission of inquiry. There was no UN agency marching in. What you had was the European Convention. And over the course of 20 years and multiple cases, so for example, in the context of the light, right to life, we could start with a case like McCann versus the United Kingdom, which was a case in which the British SAS, so a specialist military unit of the British Army, shot dead three suspected IRA members in Gibraltar. Now, these three members of the IRA were not out for a picnic. They weren't having lunch in Gibraltar. They were there to blow up the uh, installation in Gibraltar. And they were all killed together. And none of them had a weapon. And the case ends up before the European Court of Human Rights. So on the one hand, this just looks like a case, three dead people, use of force. But it's also clearly a conflict case, because here you have an you know, the equivalent of a specialized military unit, which usually democracies don't use specialized military units to do their enforcement work. And you have the spillover of the conflict into the ways in which these three individuals are killed. And the court's jurisprudence is about effectively articulating a standard of accountability for those killings. And understanding that standard of accountability actually is, which is the kind of language we see as in terms of accounting for conflict-related harms, the court's not using the language of transitional justice, but it's clearly setting in place a framework which is absolutely essential to the ways in which accountability will play out in this conflict jurisdiction. So I think that's how I see it, Thomas, is not in the... I think we have to be we have to be aware and attuned to the subtleties of the court's jurisprudence and the way it does its work to see it doing this work. Your question about transitional justice from below. So I want to counter in this way. And I speak as a litigator, someone who's taken cases to the European Court of Human Rights. And I, I, I have to say, and these are my colleagues, and we have these debates in Belfast, that I think this top and bottom is over over articulated meaning that bottom up isn't about using simply like grassroots non-elite strategies bottom up also means making deliberate choices to use elite strategies to do the work you want to do. So I, I think sometimes we have a tendency, and I say this to my colleagues who we have, that we tend to, to, to um, um, be a little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We, we tend to um, not, not credit grassroots activists with the degree of sophistication that they show in making choices about what strategies they're going to use. So I know in the cases that I've litigated from Northern Ireland that have ended up at the court, that we work with, our, with the clients that we work with and it's, and it's about telling them and engaging them in the strategy, right? And it's about them helping us articulate what the strategy will be. And the, the court strategy is never separate from other things. It's part and parcel of a grassroots strategy. Because if we were to simply condemn the grassroots to working in the grass, they're not going to go anywhere. And the grassroots totally get that. They understand that they have to be really nimble about. So I think we have to credit the grassroots with the agency and capacity to make choices that they can use elite systems at their choice as much as the elite system is using them. You know, I, it's, yeah, so that would be my little <laughs> retort. So that looks like a so, um, very um, thoughtful response, I think, to that critique. <laughs> So, so I would now say that we open the floor and we have um, Juan Daniel uh, on the one. Yes, uh, we have already a question. Thank you. Um, thank you for that very enriching discussion. I was really um, interested in the concept that you talked about, about the cyclical nature of transitional justice. And I wanted to know your opinion. So it's a two-part question. And I wanted to op uh, your opinion on... Um, the fact that why do you think 
transitional justice is cyclical in its uh, manifestation. Do you think that is it, is it because of the very multifaceted nature of uh, the issue that we are handling? Is it because um, the initiatives put to place cannot be implemented at once, uh, so to say, or it's not a checkbox, ticking the checkbox uh, effort that we are talking about? Um, and the second part to the question was that, um, since we understand the spectrum of transit, I mean, we understand transitional justice to be in a spectrum rather than a linear progression, as you talked about. Um, and since there are no tangible uh, ways to define success, uh, in transitional justice, how do we explain the cyclical nature to, say, the victims or, or the donors? Because being in the academia and talking about it as a theoretical framework uh, may sound very distanced from the field, where people are actually concerned about the success of what these measures can bring about. And we, if we talk about the cyclical nature, what is, how do we explain the validity of the same to the victims and the donors? Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, so why cyclical? I mean, I, don't, I think there are variables in certain societies. I, we, I think we start from the premise that often at the point that, that it is entirely correlated to the political moment, right? So that when a peace agreement is reached, when a compact is made, societies have a certain capacity to, for accountability. And that's variable from place to place. But for example, in some societies where you have spoilers, where you have armed groups who will not go into a peace process unless they have an amnesty, or you have limits to the institutional capacity of that society, that's the limit. That's how much justice you can do there. And it's entirely political. It's what can the political parties or, or actors absorb at this point. And of course, the trick is to say that as you move past that point, that society's tolerance and capacity grows, right? That, so I, I do think the cyclical nature is in part a question of capacity and toleration in a society. And some of that toleration is about being able to hear what's happened. Many societies at the end of a violent period, actually people want to build their houses. They want to send their kids to school. The data often suggests in many places that accountability is not the first priority. It can sometimes be the fourth priority. Having a roof over your head and having clean water might be a higher priority in the short term. So I think we have to, there's a kind of a capacities understanding with the cyclical nature of transitional justice. The second, I think, is also to recognize that the field has created expectations. So that 20 years ago in Northern Ireland, if, when, when I was, was um, representing victims, what we, the most we wanted was a declaration by the European Court of Human Rights that there had been a breach of Article 2. Today, those victims are much more self-aware about what they need. They say, well, we need reparations, we need trauma counseling, we need a memorial, you know. So the transitional justice itself has changed the shape of expectations. And so I think part of the phenomenon of the post-transitional justice is that the field has constructed over time a different set of expectations. Um, how do we explain it? I think it's difficult. Um, I think it's difficult to donors. Uh, victims is a separate category. Donors work in, however, if it's, if it's an election cycle and it's a government donor, it's four years, you know? Uh, international organizations increasingly benchmark in you know, multi-year cycles. I, I think we have to do better work as transitional justice advocates in explaining the sort of long-term nature of the engagement. And I do think there was some flaws, and, and again, it's the excitement of a new field, it's the sense of the possibilities, where we promise things that we actually couldn't deliver, where we really, because we thought we could, <laughs> but we learned that it was a little bit more complicated along the way. So I think some of that is actually a teachable moment with donors. With victims, it's very difficult. And my own experience, and I think, um, you know, maybe Thomas would want to speak to this too, because I know he's dealt with it in, directly with victims with your work with the Special Rapporteur and others. Sometimes you cannot give victims what they want. And actually, some harms are incommensurable. 
they cannot be fixed. And I think we do sometimes a disservice to victims when we suggest that they can be, or that there are, that there are perfect or even good solutions. And so that's one of the challenges of, of scholars, advocates, and others commodifying victims for their own ends, but also, and I say this as a lawyer, not being prepared to tell your client that the outcome they want is not the outcome they're going to get. So th this is where it's hard. So even on cyclical justice, which offers victims more, I'm not sure that ultimately we, given the scale in situations of mass atrocity, we ever really give victims what they need. I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> Would you say that um, in the like in the inter-American system, the inter-American court has played has played a very active role in transitional in transitional justice in Latin America. Would you say that the European court has been an active or not? And why would you say those subtle or major differences in the approaches to transitional justice between both our regional human rights systems? So it's a really good question. I mean, it's also, it's very clear. The Inter-American Court has played a much more activist role. In, fa in fact, many of the doctrines we have have been shaped precisely and very, not covertly, very overtly by the Inter-American Court. So how can we explain the difference? Well, some of it is, of course, the scale of the violations in Latin America. I mean, Europe faced quite specific problems around specific countries. But broadly speaking, the democratic character of the European states was accepted and broadly speaking, adhered to. Latin America, you have an entirely different political, you have repressive and authoritarian legal regimes where there is no recourse in many of these settings to any even pretense at the rule of law. So the court is in a completely different situation. And the second is I do think that the inter-American court was um, was courageous, actually, in a way that the European court has not been, and in ways I think that the European court could emulate and learn from, particularly in the, in the cases of problem countries. I take Russia as a good example of this, where the court deals with individual cases, but we never call out the systemic, I mean, we there's a little bit of this around pilot judgments now, but fundamentally we don't call out the systematic nature of the problem and the implications of that for the legitimacy of the state's membership of the human rights system of which it is a part. And I also think the third thing, the difference with, Latin, with the, with the Inter-American Court was actually a greater willingness to be legally innovative. The European Court of Human Rights is a little bit like porridge. It's quite old fashioned. If you look at the jurisprudence, the cases are kind of, you know, um, they have a, they're quite formulaic. It's a high emphasis on Article 5 and Article 6, due process rights. They're, they're very template-like cases. And the court never strays too much from its comfort zone in terms of the formula that it uses. And the Inter-American Court has been, has created new formulas for different cases. I mean, it has, it has this quality of innovation that I think has been spark, which I think has been missing in the European context. Just to maybe to follow up on, on this question, which I, which I also find is, a, is, a, is an excellent uh, question. Is it, when we look at the European Court for Human Rights and uh, the criticism we, we have, or the limits we showed now, um, is it a question of that we need to reform the system? Or is it something which is just that we need to sensitize judges better, that there needs to be, I don't know, civil society in Europe um, working on these issues? So it's a question of, like a bigger question of reform that is needed? Or is it, a, a, is it a question of that we know judges might need to take another approach and uh, we need to sensitize them? Mm -hmm. So I think it's twofold in the European system. So one is I do think there's a process of sensitizing judges, which is about, and in fact, the um, Council of Europe has been doing training for judges on transitional justice because I, I helped write some of their training materials. So we are trying to train the judges. Um, there's a program called, oddly enough, it's called the HELP program. So it's a judicial training program. And so this is one of their priorities, is a recognition within the council of the need to help judges by training judges. And um, 
the sex, so that's one piece of it, um, I think, um, Thomas. I think the other piece of it, though, is that the reform at the Council of Europe level. So the court has a political implementing backbone, which is the council. And when a state fails to implement, the council has some tools available to it to exercise its political judgment on the actions of the state. And I would say that the council has been very flaccid. So for example, in Northern Ireland, we have, I would say, we have dozens of cases that involve violations of the right to life through the course of the conflict. And the court has consistently recommended measures that would require substantial reform of domestic legal proceedings. And the state has consistently resisted those reforms. And the political responsibility now lies with the council to say the state has an obligation or these consequences. So I don't think we can entirely blame the judges. I think we have to also address the political mechanism, which then empowers the judges to be more activist. Because if a judge feels like they do this work and then the political mechanism doesn't support them, then the judge is going to be a little less risk averse about sticking his or her head up. Sorry, this is really two questions, the one led by your recent, most recent answer, and that is uh, courts by definition are declaratory, and whether or not you view that courts are the appropriate forum, fora, for hearing transitional justice issues. The, the other question uh, relates to the progress and it will demonstrate my lack of knowledge of transitional justice and the fact that I have not yet read your book, that as I heard you first, what I call skepticism about the use of data in determining uh, the success, in quotation marks, of transitional justice. I was led to greater hope by the end of your comments that saying we need to take a long-term view of this. And my question slash suggestion to you is that the outcomes of traditional justice, just as they are not going to be properly vindicated in declaratory court contexts, even if there are uh, hearings and commissions that are held, that the victims of what I'll call these crimes may forgive but will never forget. And they will always live in the environment so that no amount of apologies, return of property, the construction of monuments, comp <coughs> excuse me, compensation, will ever completely cure or heal or negate what went on that led to those situations. And that there is an underlying tension that even though those who um, committed the acts may confess their crimes and have some baptismal, if I misuse a religious connotation, are cleansed of their sins, they still maintain something of what happened and therefore events will be interpreted in the future that may bring those issues to life again. So there's no real issue uh, to be resolved. So the I would suggest that the longer term issue should be looked at as transgenerational. That is, the success of transitional justice will be determined not by the victims and the perpetrators, but how their children, the next generation, which leads to whole different parameters of how you deal with this through the educational system, and whether that's a realistic or is a, a superficial suggestion to you. Yeah, just to, I'll say briefly, I mean, I, I, I agree with you that courts are declaratory, but decla declaration is also a very um, significant role. It has symbolic um, significance, but it's also not um, neutral. Declar declar uh, the declaratory role of courts is not a neutral role because in terms of defining a harm, it's a statement of, of, of responsibility, of attribution. And for the European Court of Human Rights and many courts, it also includes the capacity of remedy, right? So it's, it includes the capacity to get, uh, whether it's compensation, in the European system we call it just satisfaction. So these things are not irrelevant to, the, to, the, um, to recognition 
or even to the response of the state because you know, Newtonian's rule for every action in the universe is an opposite and equal reaction. When, when courts perform their declaratory role, then the state, and if that's done consistently and appropriately, then states have to respond to that. It's an agitational universe. It's not a, it's not a standstill universe. Um, I, I will say that my skepticism on data is in part driven by the kind of data gathering we're seeing right now which is quite, in many ways, and again, these are colleagues whom I work with and debate with, but I think is quite crude, actually. It's not, it, we don't have very good measures. But also your point about how long away do we need to be in order to measure success adequately. And I, for me, there are two levels. One is at the individual level, which is, can you measure success for individual peoples? And what does, success is probably the wrong word here, right? Because... Can we measure what the experience of harm looks like and then feels like at the other side? But I do agree with you that in many, in societies that have been deeply violent or deeply repressive, the, the understanding of whether we have escaped or translated from this violence is inter, intergenerational. It is absolutely intergenerational. And one of the challenges we know particularly about violent societies is that violence is cyclical. The average lifespan of a peace agreement is five years. That is a very chilling number <laughs> because it tells us that actually societies, th that capacity to translate and, and, and to escape violence is, is a very, very challenging space. So the test is absolutely intergenerational. Is can a society move forward in a way that will not in, re respond? And the answers there are clearly not legal. Law plays a role in it, but it is it is a partial role in the work that law does. I have a question here. Thank you very much for the presentation. You talked about the need to be clear with victims for what they can hope to achieve um, through TJ mechanism. And you also said that you don't have to use the word transitional justice for TJ work to be done. So I was wondering, would you say that using another terminology, uh, banning the word transition, uh, which implies a from to to, like you, you said at the beginning, would be more appropriate and limit expectations for victims? I mean, I think the answer is it depends, right? It depends. So in a society that is not engaging in any meaningful way with transitional justice measures, and, and a victim, if you're a practicing lawyer, I speak now as someone who has worked as, as a lawyer, who takes as, a, as an advocate, then you offer the victim the remedy that's available to them in the society in which they are placed. So it might be a private prosecution, it might be a civil claim for damages, um, it might be, uh, uh, um, it might be social security, it might be a, a health benefit, that's what will be available. So your answer, you have, as, a, as an advocate, you have an individual responsibility to a client or to, uh, to represent the best interests of that person and to seek the best available remedy to them in that society. And I actually think that's where you start. I think that's where you start because usually, what victims need, often what victims need, we don't, I'm not speaking for every victim, are very practical and immediate um, goods, benefits, assistance to, to come to, to address and to manage the situation in which they find themselves in. In other contexts, it will be appropriate to talk about transitional justice measures. If a society is engaging in a truth-telling process, then there's, it's appropriate to say to a victim, this is an opportunity. But it's also, again, I go back to the kind of, the transparency and the ways in which we create expectations. So even if we have a, a number of, and it would be interesting, um, Thomas, to have you speak about this in the context of your work with the Special Rapporteur, even where these measures exist, we have an obligation to be truthful to victims about what the the best case scenario may not even be what they want, right? So in the context of truth commissions, in societies where there have been hundreds and thousands of victims, a truth commission might only hear testimony from a couple of hundred. 
In a society where, for example, reparations are available, there may be a very small amount of money to divide between a very large number of victims. So you may, able to, may be able to say you'll get a reparation, but it will not be transformative. So I, I think no matter what, we have an obligation to be very honest with those upon whose lives we base our claims, right? And um, I also think, and this is maybe uh, before I hand over to Thomas, there is a way in which um, transitional justice needs victims. It's a, it's a paradox. For claims to be made on the basis of transition, you need victims. And I say this having encountered a scenario in which the need for victims to, main, to, to remain active and engaged in their claims for justice requires victims to remain stuck in the place where the harm has happened. And sometimes your best advice to a victim might be, actually, there you may not, and I don't mean move on, if you have suffered a, an irreparable loss, your life is not the same. But there's also a way in which victims can be commodified and used for the bigger purpose of the transitional justice project without recognizing that keeping victims stuck in claim making disables them from actually making other changes to their lives. I, I said this, I worked for a number of years with mothers who have lost children in Northern Ireland. We we're doing a very big project of work with women whose children were killed during the conflict. And what I would say is that for, for many women, um, their, their lives have been very stuck by remaining in perpetual victimhood. And many of them have articulated, it's, it's a complicated thing to say, but the desire that that is not the place where they would be, but that there are huge communal expectations and sometimes even family expectations that that's the space they need to stay in. And some of them don't want to be in that space anymore. And it's not about fixing what happened, but it's about recognizing that it might be possible not to be a victim. No, Tom. No, I, I can just support it. And, and I mean, just one experience or one anecdote I can I can speak about is is actually when I was with the special rapporteur in Northern Ireland, and I had two experiences. One experience was we were in in Derry, stroke London Derry, because um, they were, the, the, the question is which side you ask and then you will get different uh, kind of um, uh, opinions how the city is called. But um, we came in from the, from the, from the, from the, from the, uh, from the south side, so through the, the, the Catholic kind of uh, uh, quarters or Catholic areas. And we met with victims groups who were pursuing court cases before the European Court for, for Human Rights. And the atmosphere was hostile. The atmosphere was uh, kind of, okay, we need to sue them. Yes. We need to basically get our justice. And we sit here until we get our justice. And uh, there was one in the group basically speaking for all the others. So the victim or the victim families who were there didn't dare to speak also. They looked always to the other, to the, to the one person who was speaking. And he was telling basically what they do, what kind of next process uh, there is, what kind of next procedure to put in place, and that the special rapporteur should basically help them with that. Um, next day we had a meeting in, uh, in, in Belfast. Um, it was uh, with an organization which takes a much more comprehensive approach. It basically tries to... Um, connect the two sides or bring these two sides together and in particular through psychosocial uh, work and to to work uh, with victims first on on their trauma on 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 their psychosocial needs and the atmosphere was a completely different one it was an atmosphere where we met with victims everyone spoke they were able to make their claims or were able to um, kind of verbalize what they what they want or what they what and and it, it just, it just. Uh, I think that 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 is important to to uh, to bear in mind. That I think um, obviously um, justice processes, um, individual claims are important, but maybe they need to be complemented also by by other intervention, as Pablo would say, at the individual at the in, at the at the individual level. But often, I have to say, when we were in Sri Lanka or in Burundi. Um, as an international, you're completely overwhelmed. 
because you also don't have the training to interact with a victim. I mean, I remember sitting in the in the east and north of Sri Lanka um, and. Uh, uh, victims uh, came in or families who, 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 who lost someone or were still looking for someone, they just had a picture in their hand and saying, where is this person? Or, you know, I, I have still a son, can you provide me a visa for that the son gets out of Sri Lanka and can, can come to Switzerland? And I, I have to say, I don't have the training to respond to that. So I was also sent there by... Um, basically the international community, the mandate I was uh, working with, to work with victims but without any training. So I think it's very important to, 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 uh, to invest still in, in training and how to interact with victims and then how to address expe expectations. And we are often not trained to, to do that. Um, so these are just two experiences I, I, I wanted to share, but it's, it's obviously a very complex um, issue, and, uh, but expectation management is a, is a serious serious uh, business and needs to be taken taken serious as you said yeah. um, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and the interesting uh, viewpoints uh, my question is about the jurisprudence of the european court of human rights regarding the uh, genocide denial laws and uh, uh, because it is very important in terms of transitional justice and guarantees of non-recurrence. Um, the court often has been blamed for being biased in terms of local contexts, let's say in terms of Holocaust denial laws and uh, often having stricter standards for Holocaust denial speeches than other, let's say, other geno genocidal speeches or denialist speeches. And I wonder what is your viewpoint or what is your opinion on that? I mean, I think all courts are inevitably local, even regional courts, right? Courts, judges speak out of and are shaped by the defining experiences that that define how they came into being. And so it's clear that um, in the European context, given the birth history, which is part of what this book and booklet uh, uh, addresses, the birthing history of the convention shapes the convention, it shapes the sensibility of the judges, just as it shapes the states who were found, and the foundational states were absolutely also central to this birthing story. So in this regard, it we should not be surprised that the particular sensibility to um, Holocaust de uh, denial has a has an attenuated, um, an attenuated kind of grasp on the European Court and on the states for whom it is of particular importance. Even now that this, um, and I don't think in the European context again it's the kind of echoes of history as we see the the rise of alt-right movements and neo-Nazi movements, that we are, we are misplaced in having this historical memory. This historical memory is not so historical as it happens in many of our contexts. Now, does that mean that we don't, the court shouldn't develop a more attenuated or broader sensibility? I think in, in some ways we could wish for that, but I, but I think you also can't stretch courts beyond their natural limits, right? In a sense, the, the, the shape of these bodies is defined by where they come from. And I, I, I'm also not so sure that we need courts that are so universalistic that they lose their particular grounding. So it's not an answer, but it's my instinct to your question as to where it comes from, but also should it be different? I'm not sure it, it can be different, actually. Hi, Fianella. Um, I was interested in your very well-made observation that uh, the transitional justice discipline, if you like, um, began in the Central and South American mm -hmm. experience and has been applied to the Global South. But I think what you mean is, is really it's being applied mostly in Con sort of post-conflict African yes, yes, states. Yes. And as we see in different countries in Asia, there's been various degrees of um, lack of success, really, if we look at Sri Lanka, um, Indonesia, East Timor, if we look at um, Myanmar now, um, um, Cambodia situation. So how do you, I mean, you know, you, you also mentioned that the, the, the key to sort of making a claim for victims to concretely get something out of that is through, you know, really domestic and, um, you know, 
really domestic legal and political mechanisms. So how does the success or otherwise of transitional justice tie in with the, the sort of democratic development or political system or otherwise, looking especially at the challenges in Asia? And also just to sort of um, um, continue with sort of Thomas's um, observation, we see that the whole transitional justice um, industry, if you like, is really in terms of the number of international experts serving and, and also the the kind of donors, they probably come out of 90% come out of 10 or 15 countries, really. So really, um, and you know, people who look more like you guys than you know than me. Right. Um, so, how do you reflect on that as an industry and as an um, endeavor when there's such a geographical uh, difference in the emphasis and the approach of it? Yeah, it's, I mean, there's multiple pieces to your question, so I may not capture all of them. I, I will say that I think um, there are very particularized stories of transitional justice regionally and country specific. And I do think there's, and this is really partly why we embarked on this publication, was in part to record a particular kind of history in a particular region and see it through that lens. The danger, of course, has been the one that you just described, is that the the field has become industrialized and I opened my remarks by saying it's also become, you know, the success of the field is defined by its institutionalization. But that institutionalization has also been an elite institutionalization in elite institutions and elite spaces, mostly in the global north as has most of the funding for transitional justice emerged. And, that, and, and the imbalances in both the production of knowledge and the transfer of knowledge are huge. I always feel like Northern Ireland is, is the caveat to that because actually that's in part why this conflict, which is a, Northern, a, a Western democracy uh, with people who look like me, all of them fighting each other to try to figure out what the difference between the people who looked alike was, right? In some ways, the, 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 the sectarian nature of the conflict between Protestants and Catholics would seem entirely unbelievable to most observers. It would seem like a, a fight of the Middle Ages, not a fight of a contemporary um, Western European society. But I think what has the, the con that particular context, um, I think, has allowed, at least in the space that I'm in, is has actually made that context, that conversation, not a north-south conversation, but a north-north conversation. Right? You have to understand that that this phenomenon is not simply an export phenomenon. That actually Western societies, and there are places. I think of the United States as a post-conflict society. It does not see itself as a post-conflict society. But we could think of many of these spaces who export transitional justice but have been unprepared to do the work that's involved in accounting for their own um, uh, violence as, as spaces for which is, it is appropriate. Um, I don't have a simple answer to how we prevent the imbalances. The imbalances are real and they are, they are actually growing as the field consolidates. Um, I think there's an enormous obligation, and this goes back to Frank's question about um, local knowledge, that when, we, when, when you think about societies that are developing their own... So Sri Lanka is a very good example of this. Some of the most um, thoughtful, um, complex, sophisticated NGOs on the planet are to be found in, in Sri Lanka. And I, I have a... We, we see a, a context in which you know, a group of international experts come in and tell, tell them what to do. It was similarly in Northern Ireland. We had experts coming in and telling us what to do. Mostly we told them to go away. <laughs> Partly because there was this strong and innate sense of our own capacity to actually come to grips or not with our own challenges. So some of this is about recognizing those imbalances, the funding imbalances, the power and the knowledge production imbalances, and but it's also, I think, about pushing back from those spaces and being able to articulate claims in your own terms, which I know is easier said than done, but there hasn't been a place on the globe that I haven't been to where there are, you know, it, and these include these transitional spaces where, the, these civ where civil society exists as a real and, and, and sizable phenomenon that has to be supported and enabled to be able to articulate the kinds of claims and the kinds of values that it seeks in a transition.
So I don't have a better answer than that, except that, it, that, that I think that's where we start to remedy some of these imbalances. Uh, we have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, because you've done extensive work in gender justice as well, yeah. uh, if in your opinion the current uh, transitional justice mechanisms effectively tackle the gender narrative, considering mm -hmm. that uh, in a lot of post-conflict societies, uh, many of the uh, people who are left behind would be women after the killings and enforced disappearances, right. etc. So let me say that I think we have done some substantial work conceptually in transitional justice, and I think at TJI we have a large group of gender justice scholars who work particularly on gender um, issues in transition. So I think we've done a great deal of work in sort of sensitizing both the field and the discourses, the theoretical discourses of transitional justice from a gender uh, perspective. I will say though that I think there are some clear challenges remaining one is that in the context of the implementation of transitional justice measures, the emphasis is still on fairly a narrow set of harms that women experience. So particularly sexual violence, which is an important and really under, historically was an underreported, unseen issue in the context of either repression or, or conflict. So we have, we, we're paying much more attention to sexual violence. Challenge, however, is that that's almost the only thing we pay attention to in transitional settings. So that in a context where there is no sexual violence or limited um, sexual harm, then there's no gender issue. And so for me, one of the challenges of the field is seeing the range of gendered harms that women and men experience. So for example, let's think about, when we talk about sexual violence, almost exclusively we talk about women. But as we know, Men, increasingly, I don't know how many of you have seen reports from Libya and uh, northern Uganda and a range of conflict sites in which we're now increasingly aware of men's vulnerability to sexual violence, particularly young boys. Um, moreover, we tend not to see men's vulnerability in conflict. We think of, if you're a young man today between the ages of like 17 and 40, you're not, you're not presumed a civilian in most places of conflict, you're presumed a combatant by virtue of your gender. That creates enormous vulnerabilities for men in ways that we don't have, we don't use the language of gender to describe that, but it is a gendered phenomenon. So I think one of the challenges is we have introduced concepts of gender into the work of transitional justice, but they're very narrow and they're almost, they're highly sexualized and they focus on penetrative sexual violence, which is really important to address, but does not end the discussion. Moreover, I think in particular in the area of socioeconomic harm, there is, in general, the transitional justice field has been skewed to an emphasis on political and civil rights. And the European Convention, for sure, if we look at the transitional justice jurisprudence of the European Convention, it's all on harms to the body in some form or other. And the, the most we get to is harms to private property or loss of private property. But for many conflicts, the most egregious harms are social and economic harms destruction of property, the inability to farm, the inability to have clean, access to clean water, the inability to, the, what displacement means for communities and individuals. And these are also, as you said, they're highly gendered, the patterns of, and effects of these. So again, I think there's, in, if we're gonna address the sc full scope of gender harms in transitional justice, we have to move past sexual violence, not leave sexual violence behind, but understand the full range of gender harms. We have to see men as gendered in the field of transitional justice. And we also, I think, will only fully get to grips with gender harms when we get to grips with uh, socio and economic harms in, in transitional and conflict settings, that these two things are deeply connected. So. We have time for one last question. Uh, <laughs> then I run out of voice. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, and I do appreciate uh, the presentation this evening. Uh, I'm looking at one of the limitations you raised in as far as, uh, you know, how we measure success in a, uh, when dealing with transitional justice. And it got me thinking, uh, with all due respect to the TJ mechanisms we have, are we boxed in in as far as, uh, say, the four pillars are concerned? Uh, if I may give a, a, an example, um, in Uganda, we have the war crimes division of the high court. Uh, 
which was charged with uh, prosecution, uh, prosecuting, uh, you know, the, the various perpetrators of the, the insurgents in northern Uganda. This court cost over 120 million US dollars to set up. To date, it's only handled one case in as far as, uh, you know, the perpetrators are concerned. And if you were to ask, uh, say, the judiciary in Uganda to gauge the success of this court, probably they would only be looking at this one case that has, uh, that has uh, not been concluded to date. However, I look at it in, uh, in terms of success because one, it brought about questions of amnesty, challenging the amnesty law in Uganda. It opened up the space for people in Northern Uganda to participate yeah, in as far as uh, this prosecution was concerned, in as far as what their views were uh, when dealing with transitional justice. So I think it's time we redefined what really would constitute success in as far as transitional justice is concerned. Because like you said, if for example, you're dealing with uh, European states that are advanced in as far as rule of law is concerned, and then you juxtapose that say with the uh, states that have not developed that much, the success on one uh, in Europe may not be the success in Africa. Look at what the, uh, the, the African uh, Commission has done, just one case, you know, for all this period of time. So I think it's, it's very important that we look at it, um, we, we do not, for example, yes, measure, but do not have so much of time frames tagged. Can it be, you know, you talked of the cycle, because what may work today may not necessarily work tomorrow. So we need to look at it as a process. Otherwise, if we keep tagging success in as far as the mechanisms are concerned, then we run a risk of failing to get yeah, success in all these cases. Thank you. No, I mean, I think the, the only additional comment I would make, I think your observations are well made. I do worry a little bit about the carceral turn in transitional justice. I think that there is, um, so in the sense that there, the emphasis on criminal accountability, which I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not opposing criminal, I should not be quoted as saying I, I oppose criminal accountability. But I, I do feel that we risk both, again, let's go back to expectations. What can criminal justice achieve? What are the limits of criminal justice? Those of us who are lawyers in the room will know that criminal trials serve very particular and specific functions. They don't necessarily um, serve wider functions in a society. And I think the emphasis on, um, on this particular form of accountability um, sometimes shades out some of the other kinds of work that has to be done in a society. It's not that, that criminal justice work doesn't need to be done, but it has to be accompanied in reality simply because of when we talk about atrocity, crime, and scale, you will not have criminal accounting for every single harm that occurred in that context. You simply won't. You will have a small and selective uh, sort of group of cases or, or a slice of accountability, and that is both practically and symbolically important, but it is limited, and the work has to be done in other ways to meet, to meet the needs of larger groups for accountability. And this goes to the uh, example um, that Thomas gave from Belfast or from, from Derry, which is precisely that we create the expectation with victims that every single victim is going to have their day in court and be validated in that particular way. And that is not generally possible. So, yeah. So I think this is a nice way of concluding. So thank you very much. Uh, one thank you, first of all, to Fiona Lapp for making this conversation possible. It was a, a very lively debate. Thank you to the audience. Thank you also to Irene and Juan, Juan Daniel for um, helping us. So all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you.